Lewis theory and Lewis structures help us understand where bonds form in any molecule, where the single, double, and triple bonds are, as well as where any lone pair electrons might exist. Ultimately, though, Lewis structures are two-dimensional. They're flat representations drawn on paper, and real molecules exist in three dimensions. Vesper theory is another bonding theory that we're going to look at that helps us determine the three-dimensional arrangement of atoms in space. Vesper stands for Valence Shell Electron Pair Repulsion Theory. Three-dimensional molecular shape is incredibly influential in determining a molecule's properties and even how it interacts with other molecules. Here's an example. This is an artist representation of the HIV protease enzyme. This is an enzyme produced by the human immunodeficiency virus as a critical component of its replication process in a host cell. Now, enzymes are very large molecules, and it would be impossible to depict each individual atom in the structure. So instead, these different strands are used to, to represent the way polypeptide chains that make up proteins twist and fold around each other. They make it easier to visualize the entire molecule. So when HIV infects a host cell, it transcribes its viral RNA into DNA that is then incorporated into the DNA of the host cell. The host cell is used to make viral proteins that then infect other host cells and spread the virus. A critical component in this viral protein synthesis is cleaving or cutting the polypeptide chains produced by the transcription of the viral DNA into the individual proteins used for viral infection and replication. So the viral enzyme responsible for this step is HIV protease. When you look at this depiction of the enzyme, the active site is this hole in the center. This is where the polypeptide chain runs through and is cut into individual segments. One of the most important approaches to treating HIV is to target the active site of this enzyme with inhibitors. The inhibitors are molecules that have been designed essentially to be the right shape to fit into this hole and plug it up. They prevent that polypeptide chain from entering and getting cut into individual proteins. And without these proteins, the virus cannot replicate. So there are a variety of protease inhibitors that have been developed, but all of them have been based on the same concept. They are designed so that their three-dimensional structure blocks that active site. In order to do this, the scientists responsible for the drug development utilize their understanding of the way molecules arrange themselves three-dimensionally. One of the fundamental theories underlying this process is Vesper theory. According to Vesper theory, electron groups around an atom arrange themselves so they are as far apart from each other as possible. This is to minimize electron repulsions. So an electron group is a region of high electron density in the valence shell of an atom. So these can be associated with bonding electrons, the electrons shared in either a single bond, a double bond, or a triple bond, and it can also be associated with lone pair electrons. There are very predictable patterns for how these electron groups arrange themselves, how far apart they are, and the angle they take relative to each other that depends on the number of electron groups around that atom. There are five major patterns for electron groups. First, you can have two electron groups on a central atom. Imagine this dot in the center is your central atom, and the electron groups are like balloons that are tied to it. In order for those groups to be as far apart as possible while still attached to that central atom, they will arrange themselves to be 180 degrees apart. We call this a linear electron geometry. 
because the groups would be in a straight line arrangement relative to each other. Now, if there were three electron groups attached to that central atom, those groups would push themselves apart until they were 120 degrees. And this geometry is called trigonal planar. Four electron groups would be 109.5 degrees apart. Now, most people would have guessed that the angle for four electron groups would actually be 90 degrees. This would only happen if the molecules were flat or restricted to one plane. But remember, molecules are not flat. They extend three dimensionally. And that's exactly what happens for the four electron groups. They can get farther apart if they extend three dimensionally to 109.5 degrees. And this electron geometry shape is called tetrahedral. It is possible to have five or six electron groups on a central atom, particularly for those hypervalent molecules that it can accept more than eight electrons. So if you have five regions of high electron density or five electron groups, then you actually end up with two different bond angles. The shape itself is called a trigonal bipyramidal. And you have what we call an equatorial plane that runs horizontally. And there's three groups in that plane. You can imagine this extending uh, into and out of the computer screen here. Those three groups arrange themselves to, so that they are 120 degrees apart. And then in, a, uh, in the axial plane, which is vertically extended, you also have two groups that are 90 degrees away from the groups that are in the equatorial plane. So you have two bond angles, 90 degrees for the axial and 120 for the equatorial. Finally, you can have six regions of high electron density. In that case, your shape is called an octahedral. And all of those electron groups are 90 degrees away from each other in both the equatorial plane and the axial plane. So let's look at a few examples. Beryllium difluoride is a classic example of a molecule with linear geometry. This is actually an electron deficient exception to the octet rule. Beryllium does not have enough electronegativity or pulling power to actually force fluorine to share any of its lone pair electrons. As a result, it makes do with two single bonds. Those two single bonds or two electron groups arrange themselves so that they are as far apart as possible, 180 degrees. This is a linear geometry. Methane or CH4 is a classic example of a tetrahedrally shaped molecule. On the central carbon, there are four separate single bonds or electron groups, and they arrange themselves so that they are 109.5 degrees apart. So to represent this in a two-dimensional drawing, two of the bonds are actually drawn as wedges extending out of the plane of the computer screen. The solid wedge, you can imagine, is actually coming out towards you at an angle, while the dashed wedge is going back into the screen. The straight lines are considered to be in the plane of the screen itself. Finally, we have a trigonal planar molecule. This is formaldehyde. There are three electron groups around the central atom. That double bond counts as one electron group. It does have four electrons shared in that one electron group, though, so it has a bit more repulsive strength than the single bonds. And as a result, it actually pushes the single bonds a little closer together. This bond angle between the two hydrogens is less than 120 degrees. It's important to remember that not all electron groups are equal in terms of their repulsion power, and the bond angles predicted by Vesper theory are approximate. So another important consideration in Vesper theory is that the electron geometries predicted by the electron groups are not necessarily the same as the molecular structure, particularly when there are lone pair electrons on the central atom. 
So electron geometry describes the three-dimensional placement of electrons around a central atom. It doesn't matter whether those electrons are in bonds or lone pairs. Molecular structure, on the other hand, describes the placement of outer atoms around a central atom. There's a critical difference there. And let's look at that difference with ammonia. This is the Lewis structure for ammonia, NH3. Notice that it actually has four electron groups on that nitrogen atom. Three of them are single bonds, and the fourth is a lone pair. Now, in terms of electron geometry, all of those groups are pushing. So we count that as a total of four electron groups, and the electron geometry is considered tetrahedral, with those groups about 109.5 degrees away from each other. In terms of molecular structure, though, Molecular structure simply looks at the atoms that are actually bound to that central nitrogen and how they're placed in three dimensions. And lone pairs, since there isn't an atom on the other side of them, lone pairs are considered invisible to some extent in molecular structure. They are there. Their effect can be seen in the bond angle because they are definitely pushing those hydrogens down. Their bond angle is, well, approximately 109.5. It's definitely not 120, which is what it would be if there was no lone pair on that central atom. So they're actually, they're approximately 109.5. They're actually a little bit less than that because it turns out that lone pair electrons push a little bit more. They have a little bit greater repulsive power than electrons shared in bonds. So they push those hydrogens a little farther away and a little closer to each other. Okay. So here's the order of strength of electron group repulsions from most to least. It turns out that lone pair, lone pair repulsions are the strongest, while bonding pair, bonding pair repulsions are the weakest. The strength of these repulsions reflects different amounts of space occupied by the electron groups around that central atom. Lone pairs are actually able to spread out a little bit more, and as a result, they push a little bit more strongly on the groups that are around them. Triple bonds also are spread out. The atoms might be closer together, but the shared electrons are actually pushed a little bit farther out so that they can also push a little bit more strongly on the groups that are around them. Double bonds are occupy a little bit less space than the triple bonds, but more space than the single bonds, and single bonds occupy the least amount of space, and so they have the smallest repulsion power of the electron groups. So this chart represents the interaction between electron geometry, which is determined from the total number of electron groups on a central atom in a molecule, and molecular structure, which is determined from the number of lone pairs on that central atom. And the way that this works, each row actually represents a different electron geometry, different number of electron groups. What stays consistent across the row with that electron geometry is the bond angle. For example, when we look at uh, four electron groups and we look at the bond angle across the row, even though the structures change, the bond angle is all approximately 109. It does get smaller the more lone pairs we add in, but it is still approximately 109. And you see the same relationship for all of the other rows as well. The bond angles remain approximately what they were for the electron geometry with zero lone pairs. Each column on the table represents a different uh, number of lone pairs on the central atom and therefore a different molecular structure for that combination of electron groups. So every time you substitute a bonding group with a lone pair, you actually change the overall molecular structure. So for example, for a trigonal planar molecule, if we were to substitute one of those bonding groups or one of those bonds in the electron geometry, 
essentially making that particular group invisible in terms of the molecular structure, then what remains visible, the remaining atoms, actually occupy a slightly different shape. Instead of being trigonal planar, what we can see of the remaining bonding atoms take on more of a bent or angular shape. And it works this way for each of these different molecular structures and the different number of lone pairs. Each shape is unique and based upon what remains when those lone pairs become invisible. So what remains in terms of the bonding atoms. It's the best description of that particular shape. Now, if there are zero lone pairs, on a central atom, then the molecular structure is actually exactly the same as the electron geometry. Okay, let's look at a few examples and hopefully this will become clearer as we go through. So the way that we would use this chart um, to predict electron geometry and molecular structure, we have to start with a Lewis structure. We then count the total number of electron groups, lone pairs and bonds around the central atom, and we use that to identify the electron geometry or the row that we're actually going to start at. We then count the number of lone pairs on that central atom and use it to determine the appropriate uh, column and the molecular structure associated with that combination of total electron pairs and number of lone pairs as part of that. Here's our first example. This is the Lewis structure for boron trichloride. And that's our first step, of course, is to draw the Lewis structure. Second, we count the electron groups around that central atom. I have three single bonds on boron, that's my central atom, and zero lone pairs. Now I understand that there are plenty of lone pairs around the chlorine atoms, but chlorine is not the central atom. It's only the lone pairs on the central atom that influence the geometry of the molecule. So that's why I only look at boron when I'm counting the electron groups. Three single bonds, zero lone pairs. Now that corresponds to the second row on this table, three electron groups, and no lone pairs. So we're looking at a electron geometry of trigonal planar, a molecular geometry that's the same thing, trigonal planar, and a bond angle of 120 degrees. Now notice that the Lewis structure as drawn actually doesn't reflect that. We don't see a 120 degree bond angle. And it's important to recognize that Lewis structures when you draw them are not necessarily always drawn with the appropriate bond angle. You can certainly redraw them. And a better way to draw this structure might be something like this. So let's look at another example. We'll look at water, and here's a Lewis structure for water. Oxygen is our central atom here. There are two single bonds coming off of that oxygen and two lone pairs, so that's four electron groups total. That corresponds to the third row of this table, a tetrahedral geometry for the electrons, approximately 109. It's probably gonna be less than that because my two lone pairs correspond to a bent or angular shape. The actual bond angle is more like 104.5. So this is a better Lewis structure. We can certainly redraw it so that we've got a more accurate representation of that angle. It's not a 90 degree angle. It's a little bit more than 90 degrees, but it's certainly less than 120. Let's look at a hypervalent molecule. This is sulfur tetrafluoride. The central sulfur atom actually has five electron groups on it. Four of those electron groups are single bonds and one is a lone pair. So that corresponds to an electron geometry that is trigonal by pyramidal. So two bond angles, approximately 90 and 120. The one lone pair, however, suggests that one of those uh, 
is actually occupied by an invisible lone pair. And the actual shape taken up by that molecule is more of a sawhorse or seesaw. So when you're dealing with uh, these trigonal bipyramidal shapes, the lone pairs will always go into a position where they can occupy more space. And it turns out that the equatorial positions, um, which are 120 degrees apart, allow those lone pairs to spread out a little bit more. So you'll always find the lone pairs actually on the equatorial positions within um, this trigonal bipyramidal shape. So that influences ultimately the, uh, the shape, what we call it. You can kind of see this as a, a seesaw. If you were to actually turn this, um, rotate it 90 degrees, um, you could see uh, the legs were down here and, and we've got the plane of the seesaw actually running vertically here, but it would be horizontal, what goes up and down. Okay, so we have a seesaw shape and a bond angle that's about 120 and 90. That lone pair pushes those remaining atoms a little bit closer together. There's one last example I wanna show you, and this is the Lewis structure for the simple amino acid glycine. Notice that it doesn't have one central atom. Instead, it seems to have a small chain or backbone of four central atoms. So we can still use the same concepts to predict the local geometry around each of these linked central atoms and build an understanding of the larger structure from that. Let's start with nitrogen. Nitrogen has three single bonds and one lone pair on it. That's four electron groups total. That corresponds to an electron geometry that's tetrahedral a bond angle of a little bit less than 109.5, and a molecular structure that's trigonal pyramidal. On the first carbon atom, we have no lone pairs, but four single bonds. So again, we have four electron groups. So again, we're dealing with the tetrahedral electron geometry. The bond angle is closer to 109.5, and we call the molecular shape also tetrahedral. The second carbon is a little bit different. We have no lone pairs, but we actually have only three bonds, two single bonds and one double bond. So that's three electron groups total. That's a trigonal planar electron geometry. We have a bond angle of 120 this time, and the molecular shape is also considered trigonal planar. And finally, our oxygen atom, two lone pairs and two single bonds, four electron groups total. We're back to that tetrahedral shape. It's even less than 109.5 now because we've got the two lone pairs and the molecular structure is known as bent. So now we can pull all these local geometries together and apply them to our larger molecule to build a better picture of the structure of this amino acid. So if we incorporate all of these different bond angles and molecular shapes, this is a more accurate representation of what that amino acid structure actually looks like. So in summary, according to Vesper theory, electron groups arrange themselves around a central atom so they are as far apart as possible. Electron geometries are predictable based on the total number of electron groups around the central atom of a molecule. Molecular structure is different than electron geometry when there are lone pairs present on that central atom. And the electron geometry and molecular structure of larger molecules can be built by linking together the local geometry of multiple central atoms.